Hi everyone, I'm Dave Cummings from Point Loma Nazarene University. Up until this point, at least in my class, uh, we've been talking a lot about bacteria. Bacteria, bacteria, bacteria. And that's, that's pretty typical of, a, of an intro microbiology course. But we'd be doing you a disservice if we didn't learn the fundamentals of viruses. And what, what I really hope you see after you go through this six-part video series is that viruses are completely different from bacteria. Um, you could make an argument that they're alive, but realistically, they're not alive by most definitions as opposed to bacteria that are very much alive. Uh, and so they behave differently out in the environment. They behave differently in a human host. We have to treat them differently. Uh, we can expect them to present their diseases differently. It's really important as a fundamental distinction in uh, microbiology of infectious diseases for you to be able to, to recognize that the viruses and the bacteria are two completely different things, right? And because they're so different, this is why we can't use antibiotics, in other words, antibacterials, to fight viral infections because that'd be like trying to use a, an herbicide that kills plants to get rid of the rats in your garden. It's not going to work, right? Rats and herbs are not the same thing. So let's talk a little in this video just about some basic concepts of what viruses actually are. And then we'll start in the, the subsequent videos, kind of building them structurally. And then we're going to look at their life cycle. How do they get in? How do they cause disease? How do they get out again? So in this introductory video, I want to give you a couple examples. In fact, I'm going to give you several examples in the first few videos of specific uh, virus-caused diseases. I want to make sure we really define what a virus is, and hopefully with that definition you'll see just how different they are from uh, the bacteria or any of the eukaryotic pathogens. <clears throat> and then we're going to look at their sizes and shapes. Okay, so this is where we're headed in this introduction. Um, just to kind of put this in a little context, smallpox. Smallpox was an absolute scourge across uh, the world, really. And in the 1960s, the World Health Organization said, you know what, we've got a very effective vaccine for this. And yet there are still people dying every year. Uh, this is totally vaccine preventable. What are we waiting for? Let's, let's eradicate a disease. And as of 1979, the World Health Organization declared smallpox to be eradicated from the human population. Last known case was in Somalia in 1977. Last known naturally occurring case. Uh, in the early 80s, like 80, 81, there were a couple lab workers. I believe they were in England. Um, if I have my story straight, I think their, uh, their freezer stock melted and they were cleaning it up. Anyway, they were exposed inadvertently, and I, I believe both of them died from that. Um, <clears throat> we sometimes call this the variola virus. It's an older term. More, more commonly, though, we just call it the smallpox virus. There is a whole Latin naming system, sort of like Escherichia coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, with all these Latin terms that we use with bacteria. There's a whole Latin naming system for viruses, but not a lot of people outside of uh, virologists, people who do virus research, actually use the, the Latin naming system. The more practical naming system is these common names like smallpox virus. We often think about viruses based on their nucleic acid. Right. What kind of a genome do they have? Well, smallpox has a double-stranded DNA genome. Uh, you might be thinking, well, yeah, doesn't everything? No, it turns out with viruses, you can have all kinds of weird combinations, and we'll talk about that. This is also what we call an enveloped virus. Roughly, very roughly, half of all the viruses that infect people have a little envelope, a little phospholipid bilayer membrane wrapped around them. The other half don't. They're non-enveloped viruses. It's another way for us to consider the different kinds of viruses. Smallpox had a 30% mortality rate. That means roughly one in every three people who got it died. And the other two-thirds who survived were severely scarred. You see this child here with pock marks all over his or her body. Now imagine all those pox, all those scars on their internal organs as well, and possibly even on the surfaces of the cornea of their eyes. People lost their vision. Uh, they had major organ complications associated with it. This isn't something simple like chicken pox where you forget about it after a week. This had lifelong impact on, uh, on the lives of people who actually survived. <clears throat> it's an interesting ethical case as well because when the World Health Organization in the 60s said, we're going to eradicate this, they didn't always necessarily uh, get informed consent. It could be argued that a lot of the people were coerced 
to get the vaccine. Now, the net effect in the end is that, as far as we can tell, there is no more smallpox in the world except in a couple of freezers uh, in Moscow, Russia, and in uh, Atlanta, Georgia at the CDC, probably one or two other places, and we have to hope those never get out. Um, but <clears throat> the question is, was it, can you, can you excuse the behavior uh, of of the the researchers and the scientists back in those days who who sort of forcibly took modern Western medicine and in the end eradicated a disease. Uh, it's complicated. It's a very interesting case study in bioethics. If we had time, we'd talk about it, but it's not for today. So let's move on to another example: measles. We're all familiar with measles. The MMR vaccine has gotten a bad rap because of a, a false. Um, journal article, false report that came out in the 90s. <clears throat> but we call this the measles virus, and look what it's made from a single-stranded RNA. Right? Its genome is single-stranded RNA. How weird is that? There's no DNA in the measles virus. Kind of like our last one, smallpox, it's also an envelope virus. And I'm going to add a little more information. We're going to say this is a helical virus, and it has to do with its shape. And that's going to make a little bit more sense in the coming videos as we look at the shape. Symmetry simply means shape for viruses. It's the term we use for shape. Uh, we're going to look at the main shapes or symmetries that we see, and we'll see what helical actually means. Also a high mortality rate, but in this case, it's from complications. And it ranges from one outbreak to the next, anywhere from one in 100 to one in every four in a particular outbreak. Highly contagious, high mortality rate, and vaccine preventable. Right? Put these things together and consider the, the ethics of not being vaccinated. Um, the ethics of a parent not vaccinating a child based on parental maybe fears or misinformation or um, or whatever else, right? There, I suppose, could be some religious exemptions. There are religious reasons that I can't think of anything in the Bible that says don't vaccinate. But you get the idea, right? <clears throat> this is... Uh, this is a very preventable disease, and uh, people die when we don't get vaccinated from it. So uh, measles is a real interesting, again, another really interesting bioethical case study. MMR, measles, um, the, the whole Andrew Wakeman fiasco. This was the doctor that published the paper that launched the, the fear campaign uh, linking autism to MMR, and later it turned out that he had, uh, had fabricated the data. To, to say what he wanted to say. So very interesting uh, bioethical uh, and, uh, and medical healthcare type ethics. There, if we had more time, <clears throat> what is a virus? Got some terms here for you. Submicroscopic parasitic filter filterable agent. Submicroscopic means it's smaller than what we can see with a light microscope. These guys are tiny. Parasitic tells us that it hurts its host. Okay, unlike a plasmid that benefits its host, a true virus actually harms its host in the process. And this phrase filterable agent is an old, old term that really is getting at the fact that um, body fluids that have viruses in them, if they get filtered, especially with old, old style ceramic filters that we used to have a couple hundred years ago, the viruses would pass right through and remain infectious. We have modern filters that can pull viruses out nowadays, but filterable agent really got at this idea that this was something even tinier than our filters could trap. And at its most simple, a virus is really just a nucleic acid protected by a wrapping of protein. It's just a nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, not both, and it's wrapped up in some protein, a protein coat. Um, as we said, about half of them also have a little phospholipid bilayer around them, um, but it doesn't appear to be required for all viruses, right? Only some of them seem to need it. Now here's a phrase that I think really gets at it. Obligate intracellular parasite. We just said a parasite is something that harms its host. Intracellular means inside the cell. And obligate means it, it's required. Viruses cannot grow and replicate and do anything outside of a living cell. And they have to parasitize and harm that living cell in the process. Completely different from bacteria. The vast majority of bacteria are harmless to humans 
In fact, they're helping us in so many ways. They live completely outside of other cells. They're living, they're feeding, they're not parasitizing, and they're not intracellular, right? Completely different from a virus. A virus really isn't alive, and therefore you can't culture it on the surface of a Petri dish or in an LB broth. You actually have to have live cells to culture it inside of, and the live cells then can make more viruses following the instructions in the viral genome. All right, so that top definition is kind of a classic textbook definition. Down at the bottom, in red, I've got a another definition that is maybe a little easier to grasp, but a little more down to earth. Viruses are protein-coated nucleic acids. That right there just about tells you what a virus is. Protein-coated nucleic acids. No metabolism of their own. They don't make toxins. They don't carry out cell respiration or fermentation. They don't build anything. There's no true cytoplasm with metabolites. They don't need oxygen, so they're not anaerobic or aerobic because they're not breathing anything. So they have no metabolism of their own. Their job is to hijack the host cell's metabolic machinery, particularly their transcription and translation processes, to serve their own evil purposes. Right? Because they're going to hurt the cell no matter what. That's how we define a virus. Here's some images from electron microscopes. Remember, they're too small to see in a light microscope, but we can see them in an electron microscope. Here's an adenovirus in the upper left. Uh, the shape of that adenovirus is actually like a 20-sided die. If you've never seen 20-sided dice, Google it. 20-sided dice. And you'll, you'll picture them. They've got 20 little triangular faces all the way around them, and it's perfectly symmetrical, which is why we call the shape of a virus its symmetry, because they tend to be very symmetrical. Now you see emanating from this protein coat, this 20-sided protein coat, are fibers that are going to be used in attachment. We'll come back to those attachment fibers in uh, a later video. <clears throat> A um, couple other naked or non-enveloped viruses. Here we have Ebola down in the bottom left. Ebola is sort of like a straw with the nucleic acid on the inside. And some straws are straight and stiff and others are kind of crazy straws that are bendy all over the place. Ebola happens to be one of these crazy bendy straws. Influenza, and we'll see examples of some straight ones as well. Influenza is an enveloped virus where on the inside you've got your protein coat right, with its 20 sides. On the inside of that, you have its nucleic acid. In the case of influenza, it's RNA. And then wrapped around it is <clears throat> um, a membrane. It's a phospholipid bilayer that it stole from its last host cell. And since influenza viruses infect lower respiratory tract epithelial cells, that membrane actually came from some human being's epithelium. Uh, as the, the entire, what we call the nucleocapsid, that is the protein coat plus its nucleic acid all combined, is the nucleocapsid. As that structure emerged from the host cell that it was in, here's a great big host cell, that's your, that's supposed to be your cell. As it's emerge, oop, come back, as it's emerging, okay, it's going to wrap itself in some of this membrane as it comes out. And then we have an envelope virus. We'll talk more about the nature of that envelope and how it's important. The last category I want to show you are what are called bacteriophage. I think we've talked a little about phage before. Phage or bacteriophage, bacteriophage, are viruses that can only infect bacteria. So what that means is these <clears throat> T2 phages are all sitting on the surface of an E. coli in this case. And they're squirting their DNA, and you can see their DNA. These guys are double-stranded DNA. They're squirting their DNA across the membrane. Now the shell, the protein shell, remains on the outside. That capsid, as we call it, remains on the outside. But the DNA goes on the inside of the bacteria. Here's the capsid staying outside. The DNA goes on the inside, and that DNA is enough to take over that bacterial cell. We're going to talk a lot about those bacteriophage and their life cycles coming up. Okay, what about size? Right, How big are these things? How little are these things? I sort of love, hate this slide here because it has a lot of cool diversity on it. It shows a lot of values, but they aren't drawn to scale. So here you've got an adenovirus at 90 nanometers, and here you've got a rhinovirus 
it looks bigger to me, and it's only 30 nanometers. Ah, oh, drives me nuts. Okay, but <clears throat> the point being, we are typically in the double digit. This is a good good way to, mem to remember it. Double digit nanometer range. So what do nanometers mean? Uh, you can all picture one millimeter, right? We talked about this in lab. Imagine in your mind one millimeter. One millimeter is equal to a thousand micrometers. And then one micrometer is equal to 1,000 nanometers. So bacteria are usually in the single digit micrometer range, right? Here's three by one micrometers E. coli. Viruses, on the other hand, are typically in the double-digit nanometer range, so roughly a hundred times, roughly a hundred times smaller than bacteria. They're very, very tiny, um, and uh, 30 nanometers is, is getting, like this little polio virus here, getting down towards the smallest end. Ebola's one of the biggest viruses we know of that's approaching a full micrometer in length. All right, let's wrap up this introduction and in the, the following videos, we're going to dive deep into uh, the physical nature of what a virus is. So a virus is completely different from bacteria. Boy, if you don't believe me yet, I really hope by the time this series is over, you do. They really aren't much more than a simple nucleic acid wrapped in a protein coat. And when I say simple, my goodness, these are small. Uh, human genome, we've got about 23,000 genes. Uh, you compare that to influenza with eight genes, right? Humans, 23,000 genes. Influenza virus, eight genes. Okay, these are very, very simple nucleic acids wrapped in a protein coat. Some have this envelope surrounding them, and we're going to learn a lot more about those as we go forward. All right. Hope this was helpful. As always, uh, you can always watch it as many times as you need to. Double check it against other resources like your, your textbook and make sure it's all kind of jiving and coming together for you.